Hi guys. So um, I was able to grade your first um, collection paper. Most of you did very well. Uh, those of you who did not do as well, it's mostly because of your writing style. Uh, some of you didn't go very deeply into the topic. Um, I, I'm looking for you to really challenge and question yourself on this, uh, to sort of wrestle with yourself on these issues. Uh, this is not just, um, um, you know, I heard this and I'm thinking this. It is that, but to challenge yourself on why you think that. Um, what have you heard? Um, and how does that resonate? Uh, is it logical? Is it, does it, does it hold water? Um, really to, to think critically uh, about the topic, <clears throat> not to just say, hey, it's this. I'm really looking for you to do a critical examination of the topic. Look at it from all sides. Um, remember, that's what a reflection is. A reflection is to look at something, to examine it. Uh, when you look at yourself in the mirror in the morning, uh, you don't just look at yourself and then go on your way. You examine yourself. You, you brush your hair. Uh, maybe you put on some makeup. You look at the clothes you're wearing. Um, you make sure you don't have something stuck in your teeth. Um, you take a critical look at yourself. So that's what I'm asking you to do. The other thing is when you're writing this, it really does need to be, um, uh, it really does need to be well written. Uh, now, no, this is not a writing class. However, this is a class that teaches you how to write. Uh, and so it's really important that you begin to think about uh, that and you write in an appropriate uh, way. Um, by the time you get to your final paper, uh, your writing will be a significant portion. One of the key things about writing for philosophy, writing and ethics, if you can't communicate your point, if you can't get your point across in a written way so that it makes sense to the reader, um, then you're not doing philosophy. Uh, you're not really doing it effectively. Uh, and so what I'm asking you to do is to really think carefully about what you're writing uh, and write it well. Um, I told you before, if you can use, if you read a sentence that you've written or you read a paragraph and you look at that sentence, you look at that paragraph, you read it again, and, and you're like, how oh, does that make sense? Um, what I'm trying to say in other words is if you can say it in other words, then you probably should use those other words. Uh, if you can simplify what it is uh, that you're saying, then you probably want to put it in more simpler terms. Okay, um, that tends to make our writing a little bit more clear when we use simpler terms. All right, now with all that in mind, uh, today I'm not going to go back and I'm not gonna review all your, uh, the ethical theories that I've put out there for you uh, to think about uh, over the past uh, few weeks. Um, rather, I'm, I'm going to begin to jump off and jump into uh, one of these topics that, that we're dealing with. Uh, now, under the heading uh, of, of justice, um, where it was uh, justice and rights, uh, we've talked a little bit about justice, uh, broadly speaking, last week. And so now I want to jump into one of these issues. Uh, there are so many issues that I've listed under justice, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Um, but I do want to jump into one of them. I, actually, I should say a couple of them that, that I see as, as um, uh, systemically connected. So, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a systemic issue uh, when it comes to justice. Now, one of the things I had you do uh, for your work last week was to do a uh, white privilege test. Uh, and I ask you to post that score and to, to think about what that score means. Uh, and, and, you know, to, to, if you feel comfortable, post and tell us about your race. Um, so many of you did that and you, you talked about it. And, um, uh, you know, some of the, uh, some of the questions uh, that, that you would have uh, come across on there 
um, uh, had to do, uh, I, I think, something about um, seeing things on television, going into shops uh, where you get products for your hair and such. Um, you know, just various ways that you might, um, uh, let me just put it this way, that white people probably don't think about it. Um, issues that white people probably never have a question about. Um, but if you're uh, Hispanic, uh, if you're of uh, uh, Middle Eastern, um, uh, Eastern, South Asian, um, Asian uh, extraction, if you're Black, you probably did not score uh, as well on this uh, as, as somebody who was white. The point is, is to help, your, uh, help us who are more privileged um, by virtue of our race um, be able to see uh, some of that. And so when we talk about uh, privilege, uh, essentially what we're talking about is a, um, uh, is a credit or uh, somehow getting um, an advance on something that you don't earn in any way other than just because of who you are. Uh, give me just a moment. Let me, let me look up my definition of privilege. Give me just a second. So here's the definition of um, privilege that, that I'd like you to think about. A special right, immunity, or exemption granted to a person um, simply because or, or advantage to a restricted group um, that um, because of certain conditions or uh, race. Uh, a right, immunity, or benefit enjoyed by a particular person or a restricted group of people beyond the advantages of most. Uh, the unearned and mostly unacknowledged societal advantage that a restricted group of people has over another group uh, because of skin color, uh, because of gender, uh, because of socioeconomic uh, advantages. So let me say that again. An unearned and mostly unacknowledged societal advantage that a restricted group of people has over another group. So that is white, uh, that, that is privilege. Um, and so in, in, in some sense, uh, when we're talking about uh, that white privilege test, we're asking you to think about what privilege you might enjoy because of your race or what you might be missing uh, as a result of your race. When we're talking about this, we're talking about fairness. What is fair? What, what should be fair in those situations. And I know you might object and say, well, I didn't ask to be born white. I didn't ask to be born male. Um, no, uh, I didn't ask to be born white. I didn't ask to be born male. But one of the things that, that we're talking about when we're talking about justice is being aware of those advantages that you have that are just inherently uh, given to you by virtue of your birth, by virtue of, of how you're born, and to be aware of those and aware of those people who don't enjoy those same privileges. And to think about uh, what is fair in this situation. Uh, sometimes um, uh, when we talk about this, uh, we talk about people who, who get uh, into, um, uh, into college or they get jobs um, because they get extra points for being minority or women or something like that. Well, um, someone who's white and male might object to say, well, you know, I worked hard, I, I got, but how much of your hard work uh, results from the fact that you were born with a particular status? Um, uh, I, I really could go into I really go into more detail, but that is not the point of, of, this, of this module today. So what I would like you to see is that when we're talking about uh, issues of race, uh, there is a line of racism that seems to run through um, many uh, issues of justice in the United States. We would, I, I would like to argue it this way, uh, that if we posit, uh, as the New York Times did with its 1619 project, 
uh, and other scholars have, have verified this and backed this up, that, that really um, uh, our uh, racial injustice began in the United States when the first African was introduced into this country as a slave. Um, we have been systemically since then disadvantaged uh, people of a particular race for no other reason than because of the color of their skin. And so everything then that is built after that uh, in some sense and in some way carries uh, 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 some element of, of, uh, of, of taint. Um, it, it is, uh, it is, uh, it is disfigured, it is discolored, it is, it is, it is in some way ruined, uh, as a result, because then that has run through the course. And you're probably saying, well, I'm not racist. Not me. That's not me. Well, you might not feel that it's you, at least in this particular situation, but there is a system by which, especially if you're white, you have um, received advantages as a result of. Um, you know, if you think about in 240 years of history, only one black man. And in truth, it's only been within about 60 years that a black man could have been president of the United States. Uh, so when you think about it in those terms, uh, why is that? That means that, that uh, I realize some of you, uh, your parents uh, are, are not near 60, but your grandparents definitely. Uh, could remember a time easily uh, when that disparity would have existed, uh, that, that Blacks would not have had the same privilege. But here's one of the things that's important to remember, is that our, our ideas of race and how we view different people, uh, and this would be, you know, here I'm, I'm beginning to talk some about uh, like Hispanics, uh, Latinas, uh, Latinos, um, uh, our understanding of how we view different races has changed. Um, uh, there was a time when, um, when Italians uh, were considered uh, a lesser than race. Uh, there was a time when the Irish were considered uh, a lesser than race. In fact, if you Google it right now, you could find uh, historical signs that say uh, Irish need not apply, Italians need not apply. The thing about it is, is that those groups because of the nature of the color of their skin, have largely been incorporated into American society. White Hispanics have been largely incorporated into American society. Um, uh, these are people who might have the last name of Gonzalez, but they look like they're white uh, because they're more of, of European ancestry uh, than they are um, uh, Caribbean, Central American, South American ancestry. Um, so that is something to think about. Uh, and I would dare say that, that uh, Hispanics are far more widely accepted than are people who are Black. Um, now, that's something that, that uh, Black students, you, you can take up and you can discuss. So this through line that we're talking about then is, is racism. And it's really introduced uh, during, a time, during the time of slavery. So what is, what is racism? Uh, here's a couple of definitions. Racism is a system of domination and oppression based on physical characteristics, i.e. skin color, and or racial group affiliation rooted historically in ideologic beliefs about the innate superiority or inferiority of certain groups, whereby one racial group, i.e. whites, derives benefits and privileges from the systemic and pervasive subjugation of other racial groups, i.e. non-whites. So let me say that, it, say that another way. Racism is a system of domination and oppression based on physical characteristics. Uh, and then it becomes a systemic problem when uh, certain groups then continue to have advantages or disadvantages because of those physical characteristics. Racism involves the stratification of racially defined groups according to ideologic notions of the inherent value and worth leading to racial group hierarchies organized along a color continuum with whites at the very top, 
in blacks at the very bottom. That's what I was saying, that it's more likely that Hispanics will be, um, people who are Latino uh, will be accepted uh, widely in American society before people who are black. Um, because there is this stratification, there is this caste system um, that is not based on uh, to whom you're born or how you're born, it's based on the color of your skin. In fact, uh, some people who are, who are lighter skinned, uh, black, uh, have an easier um, opportunity passing uh, through life than people who are darker skinned, black. All right, so how does that affect us then? That affects us then because um, much of our policing and judicial system uh, comes out of a, uh, a, a slavery um, uh, milieu, comes out of a slavery context. Um, many of the early police departments, especially in the Deep South, uh, were not really police departments. They were intended to protect white property. They were intended to apprehend uh, slaves as they escaped from the plantation, as they escaped from slavery. Uh, and so, uh, whereas a posse would eventually, you know, would be organized to uh, hunt down uh, a, a black person who had escaped, a slave that had, es had escaped. Uh, if you ever watched the movie, um, 13 Years a Slave, I think was the name of the movie, um, you can see that uh, something like that happening. Uh, but then uh, over time, those posses began to be organized uh, and there be began to be police departments. Uh, and then after slavery ended, those police departments then uh, began to protect white property from black people. Uh, and as such then, the, um, much of the judicial system then has been uh, organized around that. And even though justice is supposed to be blind, we know that it's, that it's largely not. One example where we can see that that is uh, definitely the case, that there's a huge racial disparity, is when we talk about the death penalty. Now, we could talk about this in a variety of ways uh, in the judicial system, in the policing system. In fact, just today, uh, the news came down that of the police officers that uh, that entered the home of Breonna Taylor and her boyfriend while they were sleeping, uh, killed Breonna Taylor. Uh, we have found, or we have heard the news today uh, that no police officer will be charged. I'm not gonna pass judgment on whether or not that's right or wrong. What I'm going to say is that you, you, you better believe that a lot of black people will feel that that is unfair. Um, because uh, in recent months, in recent years, we have had uh, more and more focus on the number of Black people who have been killed uh, by police. Uh, and, and that has been in the news more and more lately. Uh, and so this inherent sense of unfairness uh, is a reality, whether or not you believe it's true or not. Uh, it, it, the sense of, of that unfairness, the sense of that uh, is the reality. Uh, than that many people, especially uh, Black Americans, do have to live with. So as we're talking then about uh, race and, and the judicial system and the policing system, uh, when we think about punishment, uh, the ultimate punishment is capital punishment. Where does the word capital come from? Where do you think it comes from? When you say the capital of the country, what are you talking about? Talking about the main city? of a country, the place where all the rules are made? Yeah, well, when you talk about the capital of a person, what are you talking about? From here up, this is your capital, all right? Uh, if, you, if you think about a column, um, if, you, if you know anything about uh, architecture, uh, at the top of a column, you will have a capital. Uh, that's where the column ends and whatever the column is supporting begins. There will be a capital uh, there on top of that column. Same thing. Um, we are a column and then at the top of, of us is our capital. So capital punishment literally comes from decapitation. Decapitation. You see where, where it is there? The capital. The decapitation capital punishment. 
you're capping uh, somebody, uh, not as in capping somebody, but you are capping some, someone. You are taking off their capital, uh, if you will. Uh, and so when we, when we think about the death penalty, when we talk about capital punishment, in terms of, of justice, what we're talking about is retribution. Retribution. Remember last week I talked about a couple of different types of, of, uh, of, um, of justice. Uh, there's distributive justice, we'll be talking about that shortly, and then there's retributive justice. So in this sense, we're talking about retribution, retributive justice. So when we, when we think about the capital punishment, it is defined as the legally sanctioned taking of another person's life, i.e. execution, for a crime, usually murder. Although we know that in the US, you can also be put to death for treason. I don't remember, it's been like, 60, 70 years, I think, since we put anyone uh, to death for treason. Probably the Rosenbergs, maybe in the 40s, 50s was the last time that happened. Um, Junius and Ethel Rosenberg, maybe. I don't know, somebody can look that up and you can let me know. Um, but capital punishment is the legally sanctioned taking of another person's life, i.e. execution, to execute them for a crime, usually murder. So then we ask the question, so is there a way to humanely do this? Uh, we've, we've, we've gone from um, burning at the stake um, uh, in Salem witch trials. There weren't that many of those, by the way, uh, and that did not last that long. Um, I, I wish we had time to go into that, but there's really not a whole history of that. We've gone from hanging, from burning at the stake to hanging um, we've had firing squads, um, and we've tried to more and more make it humane, uh, such that uh, when electricity was harnessed uh, in a way we, we thought, okay, to electrocute, electrocute someone uh, would be a much uh, more humane way to execute them. Um, then we developed the gas chamber, and we thought that was a more humane way uh, to execute someone. Uh, nowadays, many states have come uh, to the point of doing uh, lethal injection. And we think that that is the more humane way to kill someone. The question is, is there a humane way to take someone's life? Um, so I'll leave that for you to, you to ponder and you to, uh, you to think about. Um, but then I also would ask you, uh, if you were for uh, capital punishment, is there a role for forgiveness and redemption? Uh, is there ever a role for that? Uh, and what if the victims, the family of the victim, whoever was, was, was killed by someone, supposing it, it is a murder, what if the family does not want and what if they want to forgive uh, and they don't want the life of the murderer taken? Um, just some things to think about. Well, in, in the U.S., um, capital punishment became unconstitutional for four years. Uh, between the years of 1972 and 1976, uh, it was fine. It was uh, determined that it was cruel and unusual, uh, and so it was for a short period of time. Uh, it was um, it was unconstitutional. Uh, the Supreme Court eventually reversed that, uh, and so um, uh, capital punishment was reinstated in many states in the U.S. Now, not all states uh, do practice uh, capital punishment. The federal government, however, does. In fact, just this summer, uh, under the Attorney General um, William Barr, Bill Barr, um, we did have uh, one or two federal executions. And that was the first time uh, in about a decade or more that we've had a federal execution. Uh, federal executions are relatively rare. Uh, state executions are much more frequent, especially you look down somewhere like Texas, they happen pretty frequently, especially across the, um, the, the southern states, you'll see lots of those. And then you might want to raise the question of what are the benefits between capital punishment and life in prison? Cap capital punishment versus life in prison. 
Um, so that's something just to think about. But let me let me give you some some a couple of other terms um, that I would want you to cons uh, to keep in mind. So uh, one of those terms is abolitionist. So an abolitionist. Now uh, think about abolition of slavery. What did they want to do? They wanted to abolish slavery. Well, a capital punishment uh, abolitionist wants to abolish capital punishment. Uh, and there are a variety of reasons uh, why someone would want to abolish capital punishment. We'll talk about some of those uh, in just a moment. Um, but if you want to end capital punishment, you are considered an abolitionist. If you want to continue uh, capital punishment, you are called a retentionist. Uh, you want to retain the death penalty. Um, now, I've also already mentioned the term retribution, which is basically uh, you, are, you are punishing someone uh, you're, you're, you're seeking retribution, you're rendering retribution, you are seeking punishment uh, for some crime that they have, have, have committed. So what are some of the reasons for the death penalty? Uh, if we were to talk about this, what are some of the reasons that someone would be for the death penalty? All right, so here's just a few. Um, some would approach this from a divine command um, point of view. Remember, we've talked about divine command. And in divine command, um, they would argue that it is an eye for an eye. An eye for an eye. They would say that their holy scripture, whether it be um, the, the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, the, um, uh, the Christian New Testament, the Quran, some of the some other sacred text might also, uh, excuse me, in, uh, uh, speak in favor of that. But in some way, uh, they feel that uh, God or the gods have commanded uh, that they uh, punish someone, uh, and it's often called eye for an eye. But but in in essence, what we're talking about is one of those. Um, categories of, of ethics that I mentioned to you uh, over the last few weeks, which we would call divine command. God has somehow commanded uh, that those who uh, take a life or somehow do commit certain crimes be punished with their life being taken. Interestingly enough, uh, there are a variety of crimes uh, through scripture that were punishable by death. Uh, if a child was considered rebellious, uh, the child could be put to death. Um, yeah, I guess some of us are glad that that's not the case anymore, right? Um, if, um, uh, if, if a man would not marry his deceased brother's wife, he could be put to death. Uh, if a woman was not virgin, uh, when she was married, she could be put, uh, she could be put to death. There's so many reasons. Uh, if you were perceived as blaspheming God, uh, you could be put to death. Um, if you committed adultery, you could be put to death. Uh, there were so many reasons why someone could be put to death. Um, so uh, here I'm I'm taking it a little bit outside of the realm. There's some inconsistency with those who argue divine command. Um, because they would not have a child punished by death just because that child is rebellious. At least I don't think. So another reason that someone might argue for the death penalty is it's a deterrent. Uh, the death penalty basically functions as a deterrent uh, to taking another person's life. Well, there might be situations where, where that is the case. Um, that you're afraid you're going to get caught, and so therefore uh, you don't um, you don't take someone's life. Uh, I would bet, however, um, most people when they are murdering someone, uh, they really don't think of the deterrence factor, um, especially when you're talking about um, uh, people who maybe dealing drugs or maybe who are in uh, organized crime where, where killing might be part of what they do, uh, they live with a constant threat of death. 
Uh, and so deterrence then is not necessarily a good reason uh, to have uh, capital punishment. Um, I, I just, I, I, I'm not sure, I never killed someone, um, but I just don't think um, that if I got to the point where I wanted to kill someone, that I would stop and say, yeah, but I might get the death penalty. No, most likely if I wanted to kill someone, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty heated and it's, I'm probably pretty determined regardless of the deterrence factor. So what else might we say then? Um, and it is then that the punishment should fit the crime. Um, so if you take a life, then your life should be taken. This is very similar uh, to an eye for an eye, but here it might be more along the lines of a natural, uh, natural, um, uh, natural law um, where that um, those who take life should have life taken. And there might be this uh, balancing of the scales in that sense without an appeal uh, to a deity in some way. Um, but there again, um, would we cut the hand off of someone who steals? Would we take the eyes of someone who accidentally blinds someone? Um, we generally, we know. Uh, the answer would be no, we would not do that. Although some, of course, would argue that uh, we should um, castrate, whether physically or chemi chemically, those who might rape or who might uh, sexually abuse a child or something like that. Uh, okay, that argument might be made, but generally it's not a punishment that we carry out. Generally, most punishments, we do not say, all right, what did you do and how can we make it equal, uh, an equal punishment for you? Most other crimes, uh, we punish by putting people in prison. We restrict their liberty uh, to some extent uh, as the punishment that, that, they would, that they would suffer. So if these are arguments for, and sorry, I've kind of knocked a couple of those down, um, what might be the arguments against? I would think for me personally, and, and uh, uh, the arguments against capital punishment are, 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 are far more and overwhelming than the arguments in favor of capital punishment. And so some of those uh, arguments uh, against capital punishment uh, that an abolitionist might make or that um, life is sacred, all life is sacred. And this too comes from a divine command point of view. Um, and so that's why uh, in, in Roman Catholicism, for example, uh, you would find uh, those who would argue, uh, they would argue against abortion because they would consider that to be taking life. They would equally argue against the taking of life um, through capital punishment. Uh, life is sacred from its conception until natural death, and therefore no, no human should do anything to contravene, to interfere with the natural course of life. Um, now, um, many evangelical Christians, however, they would be adamantly opposed to abortion. However, they would be adamantly for uh, capital punishment. Uh, to me, there seems to be an internal inconsistency there, um, but uh, the argument is that life is sacred. Uh, there's a dignity to life um, that should in no way be violated. So that would be the first argument that an abolitionist uh, for capital punishment might make. Um, the second argument is it might be that the time spent on uh, death row um, is often excessive. Uh, and so if you're going to put someone on death row for 10, 12, 15, 20 years or more, then it would make sense to just commute that sentence to a life in prison. Um, because by the time you get to a decade or more beyond the actual crime, uh, the heat and the passion of the crime has passed, uh, and therefore uh, the death penalty might not be applied justly at that point. Uh, it might be one thing if we knew with certainty and we could execute judgment swiftly, but we don't. One of the reasons that we don't uh, is because that uh, in so many cases, people who are on death row have a certain number of appeals, appeals to diff different various courts that they're automatically granted. 
Uh, and so those appeals take time to work their way through the court system. And then, of course, beyond just the automatic appeals, there are a number of appeals that someone on death row can make uh, on their own behalf or using their own, their own attorney. That leads, by the way, to a, another reason for the abolition of the death penalty, which is the cost. In many cases, it costs more uh, to keep someone on death row for a decade and to execute them than it does to keep them in prison for life. I know that's hard to fathom. You think, how can that possibly be? But it is true. Uh, many people have done the calculation. By the time uh, multiple appeals work their way through the court system, and where do you think, by the way, that a person on death row is getting the money to do this? Generally speaking, they would not be independently wealthy and have money to do their own appeals, hire their own attorneys. Uh, so these are public defenders who are defending them. Um, and it, then there has to be prosecutors who are brought in, judges who are brought in. Sometimes uh, law enforcement officials have to come back and testify. Sometimes family members or others, if there are witnesses, have to come back and testify. And so when all of that is calculated, what we find is that the cost of of uh, putting someone to death is sometimes quite excessive. So the time spent on death, death row is quite long. The cost is quite exorbitant. Um, another reason uh, that one might argue is that it creates more suffering in the world. Now here you might argue um, this as a, as a consequentialist. Uh, if we want to reduce the amount of suffering in the world, uh, putting someone to death creates more suffering uh, in the world. Um, some of the most compelling arguments, however, are these. There is a lack of certainty very often when it comes to uh, people being on death row. Uh, and so what I've, uh, one of the videos that I've, I'm uploading for you for this week for you to review uh, is on the Innocence Project. And the Innocence Project, since its uh, inception in the uh, early 1990s, uh, they have freed a staggering number of people on death row, and many of those people were locked up uh, based on eyewitness accounts. Eyewitness accounts are, are, are um, always suspect, and they are very unreliable. And when DNA, ha DNA has been produced in many of those cases, people have been exonerated of the crime in which they were, uh, they were convicted. Uh, and so uh, there is a huge lack of certainty. Uh, and do you really, if, if there's a 1% chance uh, that you're going to put someone to death uh, and that person is innocent, is it worth taking that chance uh, of putting the wrong person to death, of putting an innocent person to death? Um, some would say, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a statistic they're willing to live with. I don't know, if I were, if I were that one, you know, I would, I would hope that, uh, that no one would want that. Um, the other thing that tends to happen, uh, another reason that someone might argue for the abolition of uh, the death penalty is the number of botched uh, uh, executions. I've also included some videos on that so that you can consider the fact that, that so often um, um, executions can be botched, something can go wrong. Uh, and so there was just one just a couple of years ago uh, that ended up to be bloody and painful to watch according to every, uh, every account of people who are there. Um, but then the final reason, and I think probably the most compelling of all the reasons, uh, goes back to where I started. Goes back to the idea of race and racism uh, in the judicial system and how that uh, that line runs through the judicial policing and judicial system, uh, that there is a racial disparity. Uh, you are significantly more likely to be put on death row if you are a minority. If you are a male, you're more likely to be put on death row than if you're a woman. Uh, so that is something to really think about. Uh, so, um, uh, you're more likely to be put on death row if you're a male, and you're more likely to be put on death row if you are Black. Uh, 
or some other minority, but especially if you are Black in this country. Now think about that for a moment. Uh, and I have some video clips that I want you to watch about that. Um, the, uh, the disparity uh, between whites and Blacks on death row when uh, Blacks make up fewer than 50%, uh, less than 50% of the population uh, in the US, but they make up a considerable percentage of the people on death row. So that is something to really think about um, when you're talking about uh, the death penalty and whether or not uh, you would support the, the death penalty. So the disparity, uh, the racial disparity uh, of the death penalty. Um, and so what I want you to do uh, is I want you to, uh, to take time to watch the, uh, the video clips and um, probably tomorrow or Friday, I'm gonna post uh, another uh, segment for you to watch uh, and you to think about. Also have some discussion questions. I want you to choose uh, one or two of them uh, and put them out there. I do appreciate some of you uh, doing some really good discussion uh, <clears throat> this past week. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna stop now before I completely lose my voice. All right, guys, thanks so much.